Now let's look at atoms in detail. But let's start by dropping back to a big view of where atoms fit in the scheme of all the universe. This is a symbol called the Ouroboros, the snake that eats its tail. It's a symbol that's found in ancient cultures dating back thousands of years of the symbiosis or unity of life. Physics has its own version of the Ouroboros, where here we can see everything from the tiniest subatomic particles to the visible universe arrayed along the snake in different scales. Scales in meters are seen in the interior. Life, biology, occurs on about a one meter scale that's midway logarithmically between the scale of the tiniest subatomic particles and the visible universe. Physics must encompass and explain all of these physical scales. And for now, we're mostly interested in the small scale. We are made of tiny particles, and yet we are part of an enormous galaxy and an enormous universe, and yet we can keep both in our heads. In a sense, we bind the Ouroboros, humans at the pivot, as conscious creatures thinking about how nature works, how physics works, and why the universe even exists. This course is about astronomy, so why are atoms important in astronomy? There's a lot of reasons. The universe is made of atoms. The nucleus of the atom is the source of the sun's power and the power of every star in the sky and every star in the universe. Atomic transitions tell us about the chemistry of the universe, what it's made of. And then the properties of atoms lead to the complexity in evolution towards biology. Also, in cosmology, a long time ago, we've recognized that the universe itself was once the size of an atom. So we have to s understand quantum scale phenomena and atom-sized properties to make sense of the universe itself. And, going in the other direction, it turns out that quantum effects such as entanglement might be important on astronomical scales. Muriel Rukheiser said, the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. Well, it's made of both. We'll enjoy the atoms and we'll tell some of the stories. Let's take a cosmic zoom through the Ouroboros, starting with the size of the observable universe and zooming down one order of magnitude every two seconds until we reach the quarks in the nucleus of a carbon atom within a human hand. Here's a matter zoom. Let's take an everyday substance like sand, colored sand in this case, viewed through a modern, moderate microscope or perhaps a magnifying glass. Here's a 10 times view, which gives us the scale of the individual grains of sand. If we go in another order of magnitude, 240 time magnification, now each of the grains of sand becomes its own world, like a large rock or boulder, and we can see the tiny planes and the detailed shapes of each sand grain. Another factor of 10, and we're starting to see the layers of the rock crystals themselves. Another 100 times in, and we are now truly seeing atomic and molecular layers in the material. So we have to zoom in by this factor of a million to be able to see from the macroscopic world down to the level of individual atoms. And here, with an atomic scanning machine, we see individual atoms. The ragged pattern in the middle is the scale of an individual atom. And here is the first picture ever taken, only a few decades ago, of an individual atom, a strontium atom, suspended by a magnetic field and imaged by an electron microscope. In broad form, what is normal matter? Well, we have atomic structure such that 10 billion atoms could fit across a dot on a printed page. 
The nucleus is 100,000 times smaller than the individual atom, but it contains nearly all of its mass. This was work that was realized by Rutherford, working at the Cavendish Lab in Cambridge. The nucleus is surrounded by electrons, which are negatively charged, and they are smeared out in a cloud that surrounds the nucleus. The nucleus contains the positively charged protons and the neutral neutrons, and that's the constituents of the atom. We have the atomic number, which is a reference for the number of protons in the nucleus, and the atomic mass number, which is the sum of the protons and the neutrons. They're typically about equal numbers of protons and neutrons in most elements. And each unique number of protons corresponds to a chemical element. And these elements cannot be converted from one to another without the exertion of enormous force and energy. The remarkable discovery of Rutherford was that normal matter is essentially empty space. Rutherford shone radioactive decay particles through a thin gold foil and was very surprised when most of the particles, the alpha particles, went straight through the foil as if it wasn't there, even though it was clearly opaque, and if you push it with your finger, you could not push through it. This told him that the solidity of matter was an illusion. A second thing happened. Some of the alpha particles were slightly deflected as they passed through the foil and didn't pass directly through, and just occasionally one of the alpha particles bounced back in the direction it came from. This, he said in his notebook, was as remarkable as if he'd filed a six-inch shell at a piece of paper and it had bounced straight back at him. He deduced that the entire mass, almost the entire mass of the atom, was concentrated in a small positively charged nucleus and the alpha particle being positively charged was interacting by the electrical force and when it encountered the nucleus could bounce back out. But since most of the volume was not occupied by the nucleus, the alpha particles generally could pass straight through. The negative charge of the cloud of electrons around the nucleus acts to keep atoms well separated in a solid because the negative electrical charge of the electrons in one atom repels the electrical charge of electrons in the neighboring atom. But most mass is in the nucleus. And so logically, and by experiment, 99.99 with 15 nines percent of normal matter is empty space. When you hit a solid object with your hand, wrap on a table or a door, the sound and the illusion of solidity is because of the electrical force itself. It's mostly empty space. Also in this time, we realize that waves and particles are really versions of the same thing. So quantum theory replaced the classical idea of the atom with the solar system model, which was an electron orbiting a proton. That's a very familiar model, like a solar system, but it turns out to be wrong. So the picture on the left is wrong, and the picture on the right is more accurate. It's a probability distribution, where we can say with certainty where the electron is. We can just say with some probability where it might be distributed in space. And so particles are not hard-edged like marbles or BBs. They're soft-edged and diffuse. And particles actually now have very similar properties to waves, and the two ideas are interchangeable. So here we see in the diagram a composition of the particle and wave-like properties. So you can imagine the waves concentrated in a region of space. And so physicists tend to call this a wave packet. And that's a mental model by which you can imagine something that has both particle-like properties in the sense that it's concentrated in space, but is fundamentally wave-like. Also, no one has ever seen a fundamental particle. These are revealed to us through experiment on microscopic scales far smaller than the eye can see. We have to trust our intuition because the instruments are just giving us data that we have to interpret. And intuition can be misleading. Again, a particle is nearly not like a rigid sphere. It's like a disturbance or a field excitation, as a physicist would call it, that moves through space-time. So we can imagine someone surfing on a wave that moves across a body of water. A particle is like a water wave moving in an ocean all of its own. Also, we have the fundamental equivalence given to us by Einstein's theory that E equals mc squared, where a small number, an amount of mass, is multiplied by a huge number, c squared, to get a big number. 
mass and energy are interchangeable. Under the right conditions, mass can be turned into energy, fission and fusion are examples, and pure energy can be turned into mass, or in the physics lab, equal amounts of matter and antimatter. So we should think of mass as frozen energy. How many atoms are there in everyday objects, going all the way up in scale to the universe, that we want to consider? What about our grain of sand, back from our earlier zoom in to matter? A sand grain of diameter half a millimeter weighs about three grams. If you imagine it's made of silicon dioxide, a molecule 60 times hydrogen mass, you can estimate that a typical grain of sand has about 10 billion billion atoms. And so, thinking of a grain of sand, you get a sense of how tiny an atom truly is. A normal person weighs about 60 kilos. People are mostly made of water, or H2O, which are molecules 17 times hydrogen's mass. And so doing that math, a person, a typical person, is made of 10 to the 28 atoms, a one with 28 zeros after it. What about a star? A solar mass star is 2 times 10 to the power 30 kilos, which is an enormous factor larger than a single hydrogen atom, which is about 2 times 10 to the minus 27 kilos. And so a star has about 1 with 57 zeros after it atoms. And a planet like the Earth is several hundred thousand times less massive, and so has several hundred thousand less atoms. And we can take this all the way up to the largest objects in the universe, galaxies, with typically billions of stars, hundreds of billions of stars, and the number of atoms in them is about one with 69 zeros. The visible universe, given the contained galaxies from the Hubble Space Telescope and deep surveys, contains a one with 80 zeros after it atoms. And that is the largest pure number, true number, based on estimate and measurement in all of science. One with 80 zeros after it. You can't really put a name on a number that large. That's the end of this topic.